Thanks. Uh, please, uh, Julien Grenier, come, come forward and uh, we transition to your talk. Uh, characterization and physical properties of a lunar regolith analog for powder bed fusion based additive manufacturing processes. Please go for it. Thank you. So, hi everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the characterization uh, of our own lunar regolith analog that we use in a uh, additive manufacturing uh, perspective. And so during the next 10 minutes, I will first uh, quickly introduce the goal of the work. I will detail the physical properties of the uh, of the uh, analog and uh, the influence of the amorphous phase on the process. And then I will uh, quickly introduce our first samples made with uh, additive manufacturing. So first thing first, uh, you're all pretty aware of the uh, in-situ resources utilization concept. Uh, here, the point is to directly use uh, the lunar regolith as a source material in additive manufacturing. And so, more precisely, our goal is to be able to create uh, small objects of a few centimeters uh, with uh, complex uh, shapes by using the selective laser melting uh, technique. So, uh, the principle of this technique is quite simple. You can see it being uh, described here. So uh, there's a powder bed of uh, regolith being exposed to a strong heat source, which is a laser here. And so the regolith uh, powder, powder will melt or sinter and will form an object layer by layer. And the most important factor to consider uh, when looking at the selective laser, laser melting process is the amount of uh, energy distributed per, per area which is directly related to the power of the laser, to the diameter of the spot and the laser scan speed. And so uh, now if we consider the source material being used, uh, we have to determine uh, which physical properties are relevant in the context of this particular technique. And so uh, first we have the physical properties relevant to the additive manufacturing process in itself. So on the right, you have how the uh, energy brought by the laser is uh, absorbed and converted into heat by the material, then how the heat is, uh, is conducted in the material, and then finally, uh, how the initial phases we have in the uh, initial analog is then uh, uh, converted and transformed with temperature. And that is the part that will uh, interest us today. And then finally, for the quality of the manufactured object, it's uh, evaluated with the mechanical properties. And uh, since we are talking about the ceramic material, uh, we need to pay uh, uh, attention to the fracture toughness and hardness in particular. And before I talk about the physical characterization, I need to introduce our source material. Uh, because, uh, as you can guess, uh, we do not directly use uh, real regolith as a source material because of its limited quantity on Earth. And so the IREP teams uh, decided to produce their own replica from a basaltic lava flow in the French mountains, which we call the Isson analog. And uh, so its constituents have been determined by a microprobe and uh, X-ray diffraction analysis. And uh, it matches uh, overall uh, the mineralogy of a uh, real regolith, with the main constituents being uh, an otite, diopside, uh, phosphorite, and magnetite. And in terms of uh, oxide proportions, uh, the ESO analog is pretty similar to a regolith from the Maria region with a quite low content in titanium. With that being said, we can start talking about the temperature-induced uh, transformations occurring in the ESO analog during the first thermal cycle. We mainly used uh, two experimental techniques to follow the evolution of the analog. Uh, the first one is the differential thermal analysis, which is in blue here. And so it consists of a sample and a reference placed in a, in a furnace uh, with a temperature program. And so what we monitor is the difference in temperature between uh, this side samples uh, and, the, uh, and the reference. And so when a change of the matter state like a solidification occurs, it is either endo or exothermal, and then it leads to a temporary uh, difference in the sample's temperature. And so this is what you can see on the blue graph here. There's a single peak, which is a single melting zone uh, area uh, centered around uh, 1,150 degrees. And so when we cool down the sample, we have a corresponding crystallization area as well. 
And now if we pay a look at the orange graph, it's the result of a thermomechanical analysis, uh, which is used to track the expansion of a powder uh, over temperature. And so in the first part of the graph, uh, what you can see is uh, the slight increase in uh, strain is due to the thermal expansion, but it's quickly hidden by uh, a sudden decrease in the sample length, which indicates that the powder has begun to uh, agglutinate or sinter. And so those results uh, shows two things. Uh, first is that uh, for the process, we, we need to be at least around uh, 1,000 uh, 1, degrees if we want to do anything. And the second point is that um, there, is, there is no uh, amorphous phase in our initial uh, um, analog. However, as you know, uh, the lunar regolith always has a significant proportion in uh, glassy phases uh, obtained by space weathering. And so we wanted to see the effect on this phase on the process and the obtained material uh, by doing a parametric analysis. So what we did was we uh, some of the uh, ESO analog has been melted and then quenched to have a solid amorphous phase. And the IGRAP teams uh, already shown in previous uh, works uh, the influence of uh, this phase uh, on the optical properties with a huge transition in uh, reflectance uh, when the glassy phase concentration uh, exceeds 30%. And so those results uh, alone imply that during the process, having an amorphous phase could lead uh, to a save in energy since more of the laser light is absorbed by the material. If we continue to characterize the glass made with the ESO analog, uh, we can also make a differential thermal analysis uh, to compare it to the graph previously shown, which is in blue again here. And so what we see is the appearance of a glass transition uh, temperature located around uh, 670 degrees and quickly followed by uh, two crystalli uh, cold crystallization peaks. Those peaks are exothermic and then they could help to reduce the uh, cost of the of the process as well. And now if we try a mix of uh, fully crystalline and uh, amorphous uh, uh, analog, uh, we can observe a diminution in the amplitude of uh, the different phenomena I was uh, describing. And so the thermal behavior seems to be uh, strongly correlated, uh, of course, to the uh, concentration in the different phases and their proportion. And so now that we know that some phases crystallizes uh, and uh, during uh, while we heat the song analog, we are going to try to identify them. And to do that, we took a solid chunk of uh, amorphous analog that we have put in a furnace at uh, 900 degrees, which is uh, just enough to crystallize it, but not enough to melt it. And here are the uh, obtained uh, X-ray diffraction analysis. On the left, you have the native ESO analog, and on the right, the annealed amorphous chunk. And so passing from the native to the crystallized sample, uh, the main difference is that uh, two of the main families um, in terms of crystals have disappeared, uh, which are the olivines and the pleasure classes. Uh, but in both cases, uh, at least from the uh, X-ray diffraction analysis, um, we do not see uh, any amorphous phase even in the near the uh, piece. So the final difference in uh, composition could have an effect uh, on the mechanical properties that is still to be, to be determined. And then finally, uh, here are the pictures of uh, the processed uh, samples. Uh, as you can see by the aspect, um, the samples obtained are on the main part glass uh, because of the extreme cooling rates of the process. But uh, on those uh, electron microscope structures, uh, you can see that there are still some uh, dendritic structures like uh, uh, the alpha phase uh, is determined to be uh, phosphorite. And uh, our guess is that uh, it uh, recrystallizes despite of the extreme cooling rates I was uh, talking about. And then you have the beta phase, which are uh, iron oxides, uh, probably some ilmenite, for example. And uh, those are suspected to be um, a residual crystalline phase uh, present in the uh, initial uh, analog. But overall, uh, the mechanical uh, properties uh, of uh, this material would be uh, probably limited by the glass, glass matrix in itself, which has uh, uh, less good properties uh, than the uh, crystalline phases. 
And so to quickly summarize what has been said, uh, the presence of glass in the initial material composition is suspected to be an important factor for both the process parameters and the mechanical properties of the final material. Unless uh, the goal is to have a strong energy density from the laser, in which case, uh, if you melt everything, uh, you erase the whole thermal history of the material. And to briefly open the discussion on the future of the project, there are three main uh, uh, directions we want to follow. So first, we want to, to see the effect of the composition and the oxide proportion of, uh, on our materials. So we are going to dope this analog with uh, titanium oxides or uh, iron oxides. Uh, for the process in itself, we also need some uh, specific properties like, uh, like uh, thermal conductivity and emissivity at high temperatures. Um, and so this is quite challenging. And then finally, uh, when we'll have our first uh, multi-layered uh, samples, we'll be able to to do some uh, to probe all the mechanical properties that will indicate to us if the material we have created is good enough for its potential uh, applications. So uh, thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, I will be glad to answer to them. Th thanks very much, Julien. In fact, uh, we are uh, ahead of time, so if there are questions or comments, uh, they're, uh, yeah. they're welcome. <laughs> Uh, there is uh, Mahesh, please go ahead. A very, very nice talk. Uh, I was uh, wondering the FCM image that you showed. Um, I think you mentioned that the olivine or the phosphorite you said um, yeah. crystallized during uh, quick cooling. To me, the texture actually looked more like that it didn't melt in the first instance. Do you, no, Are I can sure show that? the images again. Yeah. You mean on uh, on those pictures? Yeah, this one. Alpha that you have written. Yeah, uh, our guess is that it uh, recrystallizes uh, because uh, this area is located uh, right uh, in front of the laser, like it's the closer area to, like it's uh, on this sample, it was the area that was directly in contact with the laser. Like it's well centered, uh, like it's the area that receives the most energy. So it's uh, really less probable that the phosphorite phase has uh, recrystal, um, that there's uh, any uh, residual crystalline phase. Okay, I mean, the texture looks a little bit <laughs> more like yeah. a residual phase than a recrystallized, but I'll, I'll leave it to you to explore that. Uh, uh, further, and the second question I had was when you uh, when you showed the graph before this particular slide, I think you said that um, olivine and plagioclase were absent um, in the in the amorphous phase. Is that what you said? They uh, disappeared. Yeah, uh, let's say uh, passing from, so you have the native uh, analog which contains all of the four, let's say, uh, main families of uh, crystals. And then uh, when we take, uh, uh, of course, the amorphous uh, ESO analog uh, does not contain any uh, crystalline, crystalline phase. It's just when we uh, put it at 900, degree, uh, 900 degrees that uh, two families uh, reappear, then that are the pyroxenes and iron oxides. And that's uh, related to what I showed here, is that uh, when you heat a glass and you leave it in enough energy to recrystallize, uh, it will have some what we call the cold crystallization when we heat the material. And those peaks are pro uh, probably like the uh, pyroxenes and, uh, and olivines that we have in the uh, annealed material. So, so my uh, question was that if you compare, have you compared the two pyroxenes? Because I, I'm wondering where did all the aluminium go that would have been, or the calcium that would have been in your plagioclase? Yeah, uh, that's quite new results. We just have done that. So we still need to do some investigations on it. We are trying to do some uh, uh, EDS and uh, and uh, microscopical, uh, microscopy on it. So it's still uh, in investi investigation. But the most, uh, like the anortite and uh, and phosphorite phases, uh, has disappeared in uh, in that case. 
they disappeared, but the elements have gone somewhere. <laughs> they haven't disappeared. Yeah, yeah, of course, I mean, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they are not like there's no change in the overall mass, yeah. so of course there's the same yeah. uh, stoichiometry. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much.